welcome. My name is Murray, one of the elders here at Grace Fellowship, and we're journeying through the gospel according to Luke, and I'm going to teach. But first and foremost, I'm hoping that really this is just uh, an expression of my worship of Jesus, and what I'm asking of you is to please join me, would you? Yeah, don't make me big. Let me, (laughs) please join me in this, right? Let's pray one more time. Lord, just help us encounter Jesus. Convict us where needed. Just encourage us where we're sad and discouraged, maybe overwhelmed. And just above all, would you just show us the beauty and wonder and grace of Jesus? It's in his name I pray, amen. So what we need today is not just some... uh, life coaching, uh, just some life hacks, right? But what we need is actually a more intimate knowledge of Jesus, a deeper knowledge of his heart, of his character, of uh, really his love, his power, his grace. Because Christianity is not just another philosophy. It's not good people becoming better. It's actually the absolute scandal that God has intervened in human history. And he's done so in and through Jesus, And it's actually all about him and how he has done for us what we could never have possibly done for ourselves. So in our passage today, we're going to look at the person of John the baptizer, and we're going to see that he's just all about Jesus, as everyone should be. And he's pointing out that Jesus is God's personal intervention to pull us out of our self-destruction and chaos and bring about a whole new beginning. Now, the crowds from everywhere are just gathering around John the baptizer, and later they're going to just all move out and gather around Jesus. And yet, when you get to the end of Jesus' life, we only see about 120 disciples. I mean, where are the thousands? See, they fulfilled Jesus' parable of the sower. Some, the evil one, just snatched the word of the gospel out of their hearts. Others, they start well, but then they, they seem to embrace the gospel with joy at the, at the start. But then when tribulation comes, when things get difficult, trials are, are, are there, they fall away. Others, they get busy. Or maybe they just start being driven by, by their own lusts and desires, and it chokes out the gospel. And so their initial enthusiasm that they had starts to wane and then eventually just disappears. So know this. If a year from now, I reject all that I've been teaching you as a lie, then you can know that I just did all this for me. It was all about me. I had no true, real true root in Jesus. I wasn't truly transformed by this gospel message, even though I knew it in my head. I was never truly born again of the Spirit I was just one more professing Christian who turned out not to be the real deal. Well, let's look at our passage today because our eternal joy is on the line. And that should be important to us. So here's our scripture. We've reached Luke chapter 3, the first 20 verses. Our reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, 
God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we? What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, to clear his threshing floor, and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. There is a lot there for us to cover, so we got to get going, all right? Thanks for reading that, Peyton, and that, uh, if you want to know about the pronunciation of names, and I say it different than Peyton, go with Peyton, all right? I'll try my best at it. We'll start then in verse 1, we'll pick it up there, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So I think Luke wants us to see right from the beginning, he's trying to make sure that these are not just some philosophical musings, but this is historical reality. This is because Jesus stepped into history to actually do the work of redemption for real people like you and like me. And so the setting is the 15th year then of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And since he began his reign around 15 AD, we're now about 30 years then after the birth of Jesus, after those events we read about in Luke chapter one and two. And then it continues, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria. Now, Philip, he's married to a gal named Herodias. And you can look down to verse 20. We're going to see her again. She's going to, she's going to show up. Um, and then it says, and Triconitus and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. That's not in Texas. It's the one in Syria that's northwest of Damascus. Now, these are the current then governmental leaders that had power in that region. And then verse 2, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So those now are the religious leaders. These are the high priests. But we're going to see that God was not doing his key work in the political realm, right? All the leaders mentioned in verse 1. Nor was he doing it in the religious realm, right? The guys mentioned here in verse 2. But he's actually doing it out in the wilderness. So let's continue reading verse 2. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So here we have this uneducated man. He's in no position of political or religious power, and he's out in the wilderness. Verse 3, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So that means all these names mentioned, all the political leaders in verse 1, right, um, and the, the, the religious leaders, the high priests then in beginning of verse 2, they're known for one thing, and it's not love. All these leaders are self-centered men, and they're known for their evil and their pride. So this is a world that's in desperate need of repentance. And as verse 3 tells us, really, it's, it's sin is our big problem. And it's repentance that connects us to the answer. 
And John the baptizer, he's inviting everyone to repent so they can actually receive God's forgiveness that's provided in and through Messiah Jesus. And so John was, well, I've got to be honest, he's kind of a quirky guy, right? He wore strange clothes. He had a weird diet. But both what he wore and what he ate was actually part of his missional living. He ate locusts and wild honey. And the locusts would remind the people of the plagues of of Egypt. It would remind the people of God's judgment. And the honey was really to be connected, a picture of the promised land. And so John was preparing the way. He was pointing to the promised one in whom these two signs would come together. In particular at the cross, because it's there where God's judgment was taken by the deliverer so that we could be forgiven our sins and then be blessed and be brought into the true land of milk and honey. In other words, all the Old Testament pictures, as well as the pictures that John is giving, both in what he ate and his dress, all those things would be fulfilled in Jesus. And so when all this symbolism comes together, there's quite a bit of excitement that comes about. So it's here then in the wilderness, this is where God is speaking. As the word of God comes to John, and wilderness is that lonely place where things dry up and die. It's a place of hunger, place of thirst. And it's also, though, where the redeeming God shows up to satisfy the hungry and the thirsty with profound provision, even if he has to strike a rock to bring forth living water, even if he has to make bread come down from heaven to satisfy the hungry. And and really, our entire world has become a wilderness where there's a famine of the word of God. See, the original home of mankind, it was where? It was in a garden, right? That was in Eden. And you can read of that in Genesis 1 and 2, right? It was this lush, flourishing paradise But it's our sin has then driven us from the presence of God in which this paradise would be found. So sin takes human flourishing and it turns it into a wilderness, a cursed desert of thorns and briars. And if there could just be someone who could make the desert bloom again, right? Someone who could breathe life into the wilderness, right, and restore it to a garden of beauty and rest and joy in the presence of God. Kind of, if we could have an Eden 2.0, right? And John's message, get ready for that very thing in the coming king. And he is saying, when you meet this king, you don't need to get dressed up on the outside, right? John was the perfect example, right? But you do need to deal with your heart. It's what's on the inside. So in verses four to six, Luke then quotes from Isaiah 40 to tell us of John's mission and also the Messiah's mission. He says in verse four, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, that title, Lord, used in Isaiah is the title Yahweh, which means the Lord God himself is coming, is John's message. And then verses 5 and 6, Isaiah tells us what the Lord will do. Verse 5, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God, because Jesus is the salvation of God. And so the Messiah is not going to make a flat earth, right? When he comes, he's not going to just fill up the valleys with dirt. He's not going to just break up and, and knock down physical mountains. John is actually preparing the way who first and foremost is going to change people. So what's going to happen in and through Jesus on the cross, the high places are going to be brought low, and self-exaltation is going to be humbled, and those who are low are going to be lifted up. You see, we are crooked, and he's going to straighten what's crooked. He's going to smooth out our rough edges in the salvation 
of God. See, that's why Luke quotes Isaiah's comments about valleys being filled, mountains leveled, and crooked places being made straight because God is, it's not because God is interested really in just transforming the physical land. It's not the mission of Messiah. These are metaphors for a construction project in the human heart. These are vivid ways of which John describes as describing repentance. And that's why, in fact, Luke describes John's preaching repentance as a fulfillment of these words of Isaiah. He's saying this is vivid description of repentance, what's going to happen in the heart. See, Jesus is truly the only one who's straight. We're all broken and crooked, sexually and, and uh, every other way. And repentance is you adapting your roads to him, the king. You submit to his way. You submit to his word because his way is straight. His gospel, then, is a, is a road of humble confidence. It's not lifted up in pride, nor is it down in the valley of despair. And in John, we see a man who's bold, but he's not arrogant. And he's a man who's humble, but not in despair. So let's look at his boldness. Verse 7. He said, He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, we're honored to have you with us. Isn't that what your version says? Well, what was it? In fact, I was going to use this in the intro as a welcome, but, <laughs> but I'm too seeker sensitive, right? <laughs> but he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? See, we know John the baptizer, he's not exactly seeker sensitive, right? Because when your opening line is, you brood of vipers, right? You're not seeker sensitive, John is going to say some difficult things. But if we actually hear what he says, it is really good news. It really is. Now, we tend to think and understand, yeah, calling the wicked to repent, that makes sense to us. But he just called these moral, religious, Jewish people sons of the devil, offspring of the serpent, who led the rebellion against God in the garden. The whole brokenness and wilderness of this world, that's where it began. This is where the wilderness and dry desert began. It began with the serpent's deception. And that serpent said, be your own Lord. God's not ultimately good. He's not trustworthy. He doesn't have your best in mind. You should decide for yourself what's good and evil, right? You need to find your own identity. That's where freedom and happiness is found. But it was a lie. And now John is calling these Jews the serpent's offspring. The ones who actually oppose and are at enmity with the offspring of the woman, the rightful delivering king. See, the children of the viper or the serpent are the people who actually believe the serpent's lies and they follow him in rebellion against the true and loving good God. See, sin is substituting yourself for God. That's why it took the salvation of God substituting himself for us. So he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And I think it's kind of hoping, it sounds like to me, he's hoping that they're going to say, God. Who warned you to flee from the wrath of God? He's hoping God has warned us. Because why else would you, a Jew, be out in the wilderness, down by the Jordan River, listening to a man in camel skin, eating bugs and calling you sons of the devil? So John says, you need to come out of your religious system. You need to do what this baptism symbolizes or Messiah will not be on your side. See, they believe they merited God's favor, right? I mean, we have the true religion. We've got, we've got Moses' law. It's been given to us by the one true God. 
And yes, that's true, but they were using Torah as their savior, not as a sign that pointed to the savior. See, pride is just the worst sin. It just blinds you to reality. And John is saying, I hope that you really do see that it is God who is warning you through me. And so this call to be baptized, I mean, it was offensive because Jews did not get baptized. Unclean Gentiles who wanted to join the Jewish faith, who wanted to become proselytes, who wanted to become followers of the God of Abraham, they got baptized, right? And they would baptize themselves. They would dip themselves in water, symbolizing that they, a dirty Gentile, needed to be cleansed to be part of the people of God. So John was saying, your Jewishness does not get you in. Being an Israelite does not gain you, does not get you acceptance with God. Abraham's blood does not save you. Both Jews and Gentiles need cleansing. And it's the true offspring of Abraham, Jesus. It's his blood alone that can purchase your forgiveness and make you acceptable to God. And in John's baptism, for the first time, you didn't just dip yourself in the water. You actually had to receive your baptism at the hand of another. And I think this is picturing. You have no hope in yourself. And you need another to do this cleansing for you. The cleansing that only the promised Messiah could provide. So John is just saying, everybody in the water, in the water. And if you haven't been in the water, hope you do it on April 2nd. Come and talk to us. He's telling them, you're all polluted. You're all unclean. You Jews are outside of the eternal kingdom, just like the Gentiles. And you need to repent. You need to be cleansed to be part of the true people of Messiah. Verse eight, he then tells them, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And this would be pretty offensive to, to the religious who thought they were good, those who thought they were well and no need of a physician, right? They viewed themselves as righteous. They viewed themselves as the children of Abraham, and thus they were heirs to the promise. So, so why on earth would they need a sin savior? And John is saying, you need more than a profession of faith. Just professing to be one of the children of Abraham is not enough. You see, true saving faith has three parts. It's professed. You profess, speak through mouth. You confess indeed. You believe, all right, that Jesus, and what he did on the cross, that was for me. He was the sin bearer, my only hope. You believe in the resurrection, that God has accepted what Jesus has done on the cross in his atoning work. And then secondly, it's practice. So you have not just the truth of it that you believe, but it's practice. Saving faith actually evidences itself in fruit because the fruit is actually showing what you really believe, not what you just believe you believe. It shows what you actually believe and love at your core. And then thirdly, faith is persevering. It continues to be professed and practiced all the way to the end. And so John, he's really addressing this second part of saving faith, their practice. Because true repentance shows itself in fruit. Now this whole thing is offensive to the Jews because John is actually questioning their relationship with God. And he makes it clear, you need to repent of both your sin and your religion. And repentance, it's the highway upon which God's forgiveness actually comes to us. Repentance literally means a change of mind or heart. 
right? It's not just feeling bad for what I did wrong. It's not just confessing individual sins. But repentance is a change of mind about who's on the throne. And it's surrendering to the real king and his word. It's a confession of sin at the root level. And it's a wonderful, gracious call. It's not do some great thing, perform some exploit, right? It's not earn your stripes. It's not prove yourself. And then maybe after three years of faithful commitment, then you can be accepted. No, it's repentance. It's just right now, in a moment, just surrender to Jesus as Lord. Is that not just incredible grace? It's just wave the white flag, you know? See, the problem's not out there. It's in here. That's John's message. Quit trying to blame all your problems on something or someone out there. And John is saying, if you want to be part of God's new kingdom, get baptized now as a sign of your heartfelt repentance. Come join this new thing because the king's about to arrive, the long-awaited for Messiah. So John is a voice. He is a pointer, not to have the focus on him, but on someone else. And he is pointing to the breaking in of the kingdom of God in the person of Messiah Jesus. And he's trying to get people to recognize they're on the brink of the most incredible act of God in all of human history, that everything in history has been aiming at, and he is just begging people to please don't miss it. To miss Jesus is devastating for eternity. And so he wants people to be ready to, to meet and encounter Jesus, right? So he's preparing them to meet Jesus with humility because to meet Jesus with pride is to oppose this almighty king as an enemy. Whereas to meet him in humility is to receive grace that will blow your mind. See, the posture of your heart is crucial, John is saying. In verse 9, in his proclamation of repentance, John cries out, the axe is laid to the root. Because you see, that's what repentance is. Repentance is changing your root. Repentance is changing what you trust in, what, where you draw your life from. And what is the ax? Well, John's message is the ax, right? It's his message is an ax laid at the root because he wants to remove you from that old root before it's too late. Because remember, verse 8, right? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. In verse 9, he said, And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the fruit of your life is exposing your roots, your heart. It's exposing what you worship. It's exposing what you love. It's exposing what your life is truly rooted in. It's exposing your core belief. Your roots sink down into what sustains you. And John wants his message to cut you off at the roots and all other sources of life, all other idols, because that then sets you up to be ready to be grafted and rooted in and find your life and identity in Jesus, the true vine. And John is telling the Jews, don't say God can't cast me off. I mean, I'm one of the chosen people, right? I'm one of Abraham's offspring. I'm a sincere Jew who's rooted in Abraham. And John's saying, oh, yes, he can, and he will, and he'll replace you with a stone, one who loves and honors God more than you. Because he's basically saying, if you were Abraham's offspring, then you'd have faith in the very one Abraham foretold, looked to, and put his faith in. And when John the baptizer says, God can raise up children from these stones, he's saying that's exactly what he's going to do. And he did. And all of us who had hearts of stone, he turned into his children of faith. He grafted us into the true vine so we could be rooted in him and not in all the other idols and things we're trying to find life in. Let's continue, verse 10. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? 
And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. And I want to go, what is that? I mean, John just finished telling them, right, that their obedience and their morality won't save them. And then he says this. I mean, didn't he just say our doing won't save us or make us acceptable with God? And then he gives them stuff to do. I mean, I got to go, has John been eating too many locusts? Like, no, this is not a list of things to do for God's approval. It's actually the fruit or evidence, he says, of genuine repentance, a genuine change of roots, a new heart and a new Lord. And notice, it's not a bunch of rules about don't do this, don't do that. He's actually describing a life of love because that's the life that's experienced the undeserved grace and love of God. So one result of receiving forgiveness and grace and this, this incredible love from God is now seeing that all that we are and all that we have, we just we see all that we own just in a different light. The, the one then to whom God is showing compassion then begins to have this heart of compassion for, for others. For they know what it is to be loved and cared for by God when they did not deserve it. And those who have had the grace and goodness of God poured out on them, they can't just look at the hurting and the lost and the, the suffering and the poor and go, oh, praise God, I'm not like them. No, you see, God's been abundantly generous with us, so we're generous to others in need as we have the God-given means to do so. The grace of the gospel changes how you view your stuff changes how you view money. It changes how you view your life. Because in repentance, right, you're glad to belong to God. And all your stuff is his. Everything you own and have is simply a gift of, of his that's been uh, given to you to steward for his glory. See, once we declared mine, right? But now we gladly declare it's all yours. It's all yours. And then he keeps going after possessions, after money and what they live for. Verse 12, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So that's another mark of genuine repentance, right? It's not using our power and our influence and our authority and our position for self-gain, for self-benefit. Notice, he doesn't tell them to go get different jobs, right? Stop being a tax collector, right? Stop being a soldier. No, what he does say is do your job differently. Your, the way you do your job should look different. God puts people in positions of power to serve others. That's what love does, right? It's not self-seeking, right? Love is about giving, not taking, right? How we treat other people, that is a fruit of genuine repentance. And it really helps us see whether we're truly born of God. Because if we don't live that way, if the fruit of our lives exposes that we're actually all about ourselves, good news. Now we can repent and throw ourselves on the free mercy and grace of God in absolute surrender and just be received by God as a son or daughter. See, God's not after grudging submission to rules, but this is fruit of genuine love that comes from someone who's been greatly loved. And John's describing that, it's, that that only flows out of transformed hearts of joy and love that have been changed by grace. It's like if you ask me, you know, how's your marriage doing? And I said, well, I gave my word, so I'm in. It's a real challenge being married to that woman. But I made a promise, and I'm a man of my word. You know, so I'll do my duty. I will keep my word for the rest of my long, 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 very long life. Are you going, wow, what a guy, right? I want a marriage like that. 
right? One that's all about real commitment and duty, right? No, you're going, oh, that poor woman, right? But think about it. How many treat and view Christianity just like that? And we wonder why people aren't running to church saying, I want to get me some of that. See, God is saying, I'm not glorified by your grudging submission and duty. I'm glorified by your joy and love and contentment in me that changes how you live. See, John the Baptist, he's not out to control them. He's not out trying to get their money, right? He's after their joy. And he knows stuff won't complete our joy. Jesus is after our joy. He's not after joyless duty. Because that's what they were already doing, right? So as they're cut to the heart, and they acknowledge the truth that what John is speaking, yeah, that's true. And they acknowledge the reality of their sin, the reality of their brokenness, the reality of them trying to find life and satisfaction and rooting into other things. And here they've got John. This guy's actually telling them straight up the way it is. He's a guy not just affirming them. And so they start to wonder, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the Christ. Verse 15 as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. I mean, after all, he had this incredible, miraculous birth, right? Uh, They've never seen a prophet like him. Verse 16, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water. That's all I got. But he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And John is saying, that's why I'm trying to call you to repentance now, right? So you're ready for this king's coming. In fact, John says, if you think I'm him, you have way too low thoughts of the Messiah, because I can just provide you with the picture, the symbol, baptism in water. But this Jesus, whom you're about to meet, he's not in the same category with me at all. I'm not even worthy to be in his presence in the lowest position. Not even in the most despised and disgusting role, which is what it was viewed as to untie somebody's sandals and care for their feet. I mean, they didn't even wear socks with their sandals back then. You know? Of course, nobody should ever wear socks with their sandals, right? But that's another point. But the one he's pointing to, he's saying, he'll perform the real baptism, right? With the Holy Spirit and fire. He's going to bring about a division, a separation, just like Simeon prophesied. The Spirit of God is the one who grants us a new birth, grants us eyes to see, and he convicts us of sin and he shows us the Savior. So we can be gathered into God's own kingdom, having been forgiven all our sins, but the chaff. You don't want to go into the presence of God who's a consuming fire as chaff, as an enemy, as one who is continuing to harden your heart against the Spirit's convicting. And here's some good news. There is not one person who comes to Jesus in repentance that he will reject. I believe the Spirit of God has brought you here, or maybe listening to this, as his invitation to repent for the forgiveness of your sins that you might see it's God himself in gracious, merciful love who's warning you and calling you to himself. Repent is such a beautiful command. It really is. It's not do your duty, not shape up, not try harder, do better. Um, It's just surrender. Stop resisting. Just fall into the nail-scarred hands of the Savior. That's no effort at all. Takes me no effort to fall, 
I, I resist falling. I have to do effort to stop falling, but it takes no effort at all. Just stop resisting. Experience his love and transforming grace that he offers you. And if you do that, he'll fill up the valleys. He'll bring down the pride in the high places. He'll expose it in your heart. And he'll lift us up out of our despair and self-loathing. And he'll straighten out that which is crooked in us. And he'll rub off the rough places. And he'll do it tenderly in love for our joy and our good. Jesus is going to show up in the wilderness, our wilderness, our desert, with his life-giving presence. And he'll pour out his spirit, the spirit who turns wastelands and graveyards into gardens and brings life to our dead and stony hearts. And he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And it's going to cleanse on the inside. And eventually he's going to baptize the whole world with fire. And he's going to make everything perfect. Therefore, we have to realize, if this is coming into our life, then let's not diss Jesus saying things like, God can't really change me. God can't work in my life. God can't fix me. God can't ever help me in this area. That's pretty low expectations for what this mighty Messiah can do in your life. It's not treating him as the mighty king that John's pointing to. Verse 18, he says, so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. And notice this preaching of repentance and being warned is good news, right? It's good news when you examine yourself. It's good news when you see lack of fruit because then you stop looking to yourself and you start throwing yourself, you can throw yourself again on the free mercy and grace of Jesus as your only hope. For there's nothing for us to do or accomplish. Simply surrender to the gracious king who can bestow forgiveness and grant amnesty and gather us to himself as his own precious people. And then verse 9 starts with what word? But. Here comes a contrast. Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him, that's John, for Herodias, his brother's wife. You see, Herod had divorced his wife, hooked up with his half-brother's wife, Herodias, who was also his niece, yeah, I know it's messed up, right? And John wouldn't affirm them. He wouldn't affirm what they were doing. And for all the evil things that Herod had done and added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Oh, he just poked the apple of God's eye. So Luke shows us an unrepentant response. And he shows it in Herodias and Herod. John invited them to repent. He gave them good news. But they don't like what God says is right and good. They want to be sexually free. They want to hook up with whomever they want, whenever they want. And they view God's word not as truth for their ultimate good and joy, they actually see it as a repressive restraint on what they believe will give them happiness and freedom. And John tells Herod that what he's doing is not an alternative lifestyle, it's evil. And it's destructive. And it's destructive to you, Herod. It's destructive to Herodias. It's hurting you guys. It's hurting others. It's hurting your families. And ultimately, it's giving God the finger. So Herod and Herodias call John intolerant. And they lock him in prison. And though Herod is arrogant, he is lifted up. He has power in the moment. And he seems to be the one in control. He seems to be the one who's free because John is the one who's locked up in prison and not having sex. But it's John who's truly free. 
He's free from his sin. He has God's forgiveness. He is free forever as a beloved child of God. In and through Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of those who repent. And John is the one who ultimately will have no regrets. I'd rather be in the shoes of John in a prison, not having sex, than in the shoes of Herod. And he will be dealt with justly by the God of the universe. Wouldn't you rather be in John's shoes? John didn't have the favor of Herod. But he had the favor of Jesus. He had the favor of God. And humble repentance is the only way to prepare for the coming of the Christ, both in his first coming and in his second coming for which we eagerly await. And all through the rest of this gospel, Jesus is going to move towards people who are in the wilderness. And he is going to satisfy the hungry and the thirsty he is going to move towards the outcast and the weary and the sick and the lonely and the diseased. And ultimately, Jesus himself, the glorious king of life, he himself becomes a wasteland. Thorns crown his brow as he thirsts, as he is hungry, and he is under our curse, and he dries up and dies outside the city by the garbage dump. He identifies with our curse, with our lonely wilderness, our barrenness, so he can be raised on the third day to be the beginning of a new creation into which he'll raise us up with him, inviting us to dine with him and not simply as guests, but as sons and daughters at his father's table. You know, Mary Magdalene, she mistook him for a gardener when she saw the resurrected Jesus. I think she was right. Because he turns barren deserts and wastelands back into a garden. And he tends and he cares for it as a good husband, shepherd, and friend. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege that we can call you our Abba, our heavenly dad. What an honor that we can have the forgiveness of all our sins and be received as sons and daughters. And it's not because of anything we have done, because it's your baptism, Jesus, where you were baptized under the judgment, your own judgment that we deserved. But death couldn't hold you. You rose again as the first fruits of which we who are united to Jesus will come into this new life, this new creation, this better garden paradise of rest and walking in the presence of you. Oh, Lord, help us appreciate what you've done for us in Jesus, that you've come into our wilderness and you have rescued us. So we give you thanks and praise and we ask that you would continue to help us humble ourselves, continue to help us to repent in an ongoing way and continue just to trust you because you are good and you are a great savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.